Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I welcome you to another amazing episode of our webinar Wednesdays. I am Nishita, and I serve as the PR and Communications Coordinator for the Space Safety and Sustainability Project Group here at the SGAC. And I am very happy to be welcoming all of you. Uh, today, we have a very interesting session on terraforming, and we are joined by experts in the field. We have with us Fred, Alessandra, uh, Kevin, and Lawrence, and we also have Mahad. Um, uh, I, before I hand over to Mahad, I would just like to shortly introduce him. Uh, Mahad is the current co-lead of the Space Safety and Sustainability Project Group, and he has over a decade of experience in the field of space situational awareness and also space domain awareness, and he has been the recipient of the IAF Young Space Leader Award, as well as SJAC's Nebula Award and the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics Ascend Divers Design Award. And we have quite an accomplished person here among us. And Mahad will be uh, taking over the webinar. And in the next one and a half hour, you can anticipate some incredible discussions and you can take back a lot of insights. And with that, Mahat, I will hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Nishita. <clears throat> thank you, Nishita. You've been very kind with that, that fantastic introduction. Um, well, welcome to welcome to this webinar. Um, uh, this is uh, the one of the, uh, this webinar is among the series webinar Wednesdays in which the Space Safety and Sustainability Project Group brings on uh, influential speakers uh, who are doing anything related to space safety and sustainability. So uh, just a brief history of uh, how this uh, webinar came into um, a pragmatic reality is uh, Kevin and Lawrence uh, and their educational distributor of uh, the documentary Terraforma. They were at uh, a European Space Agency conference where they found out about the activities of uh, SGAC and also Space Safety and Sustainability Project Group. And uh, using the SGAC website, they reached out to us and uh, we had a few meetings and we dis discussed about how we can create an educational session on the basis of this documentary that can be used uh, as, uh, as an educational material for uh, spreading how uh, Terraforma affects um, are, are the sustainability of our future. So Terraforma is uh, the story of a remote volcanic island of ascension. And uh, for a million years, uh, the island was entirely devoid of life, but um, it was it was geoengineered by the process called terraforming into, into a tropical paradise kind of stuff. So it is also the story of uh, what the transformation may mean for the fate of our planet and the planets where we'll, we'll go into future. Um, so uh, it really, uh, it's all about how human engineering, how artificial bioenvironments can uh, be an opportunity, but also be uh, something that we have, need to have some ethical, ethical considerations about. So uh, that's the documentary. I've seen the documentary, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, and uh, before I talk uh, any more about the documentary, uh, I would like to uh, briefly introduce our speakers. Um, so we have, uh, first we have uh, Fred Sherman. Fred Sherman is a designer, architect, author, and researcher whose, whose work focuses on how we imagine new spaces for future worlds and who is invited into, into them. He's the author of two books about the history of the idea that humans can and should go and live in space. So Space Settlements is one of those books, and Space Force is another book. Uh, he also co-founded Brick Moon, which is a consultancy for space habitat design. Uh, he also co-founded the working group on adaptive systems, which is an art and design consultancy based in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and he also teaches architecture and urban design. So Fred is a really accomplished person. We are really lucky to have him with us. So Fred, would you like to give a brief introduction about yourself? Oh, sure. I mean, just for the past uh, about seven years or so, I've been interested in, in sort of making connections between people in what I think of as the traditional spatial practice discipline. So um, where I'm coming from in architecture and urban design, but also things like landscape architecture, planning and civil engineering with people working in space science, because as we you know, increasingly like we're in this sort of new, almost golden age of space exploration and living in space is 
as these activities expand, there's a lot that I think each set of fields can learn for one another, that the people who design small, you know, would be sort of world surrogates from the scale of the space station to the space suit can learn a lot from people who design the built environment on Earth and also, of course, vice versa. So that's why I like having these conversations. Uh, thank you, Fred. Very, very glad to have you. Um, next, we have uh, Alessandra. Uh, and Alessandra is a sustainability professional and entrepreneur. She has worked as a sustainability consultant for over eight years, specializing in the extractive industries and uh, leading standard setting and multi-stakeholder initiatives to improve environmental, social, and governance standards in, in the mineral and metal supply chains. Passionate about space and space resources graduate, uh, she's also a graduate student at Colorado School of Mines. Uh, Alessandra builds upon her trustful experience to advance knowledge, practices, and standards in the emerging fields of space sustainability, with a focus on space resources exploration and utilization. Um, a member of SGAC SSSS project group, Alessandra is part of the UNESCO World Heritage uh, of the Space Orbits project, and uh, we're very glad to have you here. Alessandra, would you like to just you know say a few words about about yourself? Thank you, Mahad. Um, like you said, I'm a sustainability professional, and um, I noticed how we started to talk about space sustainability more and more in recent years. So I'm passionate about, you know, using what we've learned here on Earth to do better in space. I think as we continue to venture into space, we have an opportunity to start almost from scratch, maybe not from scratch anymore if we look at what's happening in our Earth's orbits, but definitely we can do better and more as we go further into space. So I'm excited to depart, be part of this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. Next, we have uh, Kevin and Lawrence, who are the co-producers of the documentary. Kevin Brennan is an artist and a filmmaker based in London and a graduate of the Slade, graduate of uh, the Slade School of Fine Arts. His film explores ideas sounding technological evolution and its impact on human ontology using a variety of visual languages pulled from videos, music videos, and cinema. Uh, Lawrence Durkin is a writer and documentary filmmaker uh, since studying at uh, FAMU in Prague. He's, his films have spanned genres, form, and languages with continuous threads of dialogue, which are questions of technology, identity, alienation, and the challenge of living in human-made environments. So Kevin and Lawrence, would you please introduce yourselves respectively? Kevin, you're mute. Kevin, you're mute. We can't hear you. I beg your pardon. Sorry. Thank you, Mahad. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess, yeah, first what you said. Uh, hi, I'm Kevin, and uh, I'm a, a, a visual artist and filmmaker originally from Galway in Ireland and based in London at the moment, uh, finishing a postgrad at the Royal Academy of Arts. Um, I guess just first what uh, Mahad said, I came to film through art, um, making video works and installations, um, which uh, always kind of, I guess, uh, explored ideas around the impact of technology on human experience and um, focusing mainly on media formats such as the internet and virtual realities and I started working on documentary uh, when I set up my production company with Lawrence uh, called Silver Strand Productions in 2021 and uh, from there we made Terraforma which we'll be speaking about tonight which is about the uh, as you said the terraforming of Ascension Island um, and I guess in my work since then, since Terraforma, the idea of kind of technology has taken a kind of environmental direction <clears throat> of kind of been looking at ideas of artificiality and human built environments in in, in nature, uh, more specifically uh, monoculture forests um, in Ireland and so on. So, yeah, I guess, Lawrence, if you want to say a few words. Hi, yeah, I'm Lawrence. Um, I think Kevin covered that pretty well, but uh, but yeah, I'm interested to see what everyone has to say. We obviously come at this from the um, filmmaking perspective, and we're very much not scientists or uh, experts in the field. Um, so as you'll see in the film, a lot of the ideas we were, that we kind of amassed were collections from various interviews with experts. Uh, so yeah, I'm excited to see what everyone has to say today. Uh, thank you, Kevin and Lawrence. Uh, now we'll just start uh, jump right into our webinar. So Kevin and Lawrence, back to you with the introduction of Terraforma uh, uh, and the presentation and the video clips. 
Sure. So I'll introduce the uh, the film a bit to start with. Um, so in 2022, Kevin and I travelled to Ascension Island, which is uh, an incredibly remote desert island, um, and we didn't really know what to expect. Um, we'd read pretty much every book ever written about Ascension, which means about five books. Uh, and so the place was totally a mystery to us when we arrived. What we had read, though, was uh, a number of research papers which claimed that the story of the greening of this remote, remote volcanic island of Ascension could provide a useful test case to study how we could bring life to Earth's driest deserts, um, create new carbon sequestering forests on barren land, um, and even terraform other planets like Mars. Uh, we're going to show an excerpt, an excerpt from the film that we shot in Ascension, in which we explored whether this island really was a template for these terraforming plants. Um, but I'll preface the clip by explaining a bit more about the island itself. Um, so Ascension was formed about a million years ago during a volcanic eruption. Uh, deep beneath the Atlantic Ocean, the magma surfaced, solidified, and then sat smoldering and isolated uh, almost a thousand miles from any other land. Um, so because it was so far from any other land masses, very little life had arrived over the million years of the island's existence. Birds had arrived, um, of which there were several endemic species, crabs, turtles, and a few species of plant, uh, plants um, whose spores were presumably carried inadvertently by the seabirds. Um, but for whatever did wash up on the island, life was very difficult. Ascension, uh, besides being very thinly populated with any form of life at all, um, has virtually no fresh water, only a small stream at the peak of the mountain. Um, uh, the first humans who laid, laid out on the, uh, on the island were about 500 years ago. They were Portuguese sailors, um, and they didn't even bother to step ashore. They could see there was nothing there. Um, so over the next few hundred years, there are occasional stories of castaways washing up on the island at various points, but they almost all die of thirst or hunger very quickly. So it's not a, not a good place to live. But eventually, um, in the 19th century, the British decide to try and settle the island. Um, and for the Victorian naturalists who arrive on the island, the island is kind of a fascinating opportunity for them to test out their new theories. The island was so devoid of life as to be essentially a blank slate for them to you know, experiment their new, um, their new thoughts. It was a tabula rasa. Um, I think it's hard to imagine this now, but and it's difficult in making a film which is sort of a science fiction film about Victorians. But these Victorian scientists who wash up on the island are in an era of technological and scientific innovation, which is in a lot of ways more radical and dynamic than now. It seems hard to imagine, but they're living in a time when the future was now. So they decided to use the new technologies and kind of theories gleaned from the recent explosion of interest in uh, botany and the natural sciences to create a new kind of nature on the island and to bring life to a totally barren rock. So it was theorized that by planting trees on the mountain, the highest point, they might be able to attract rain. Um, so they started to import plants from all corners of the British Empire um, to see what could survive. And at the peak of the mountain, where clouds would gather, and still do, they planted thousands of trees, essentially seeding the clouds um, and attracting moisture to the soils. So now the trees have reproduced, the forest has spread, uh, the forest has spread, and it's now a functioning ecosystem. Um, almost impossible to tell apart when you go up there, many kind of natural rainforest. Uh, nonetheless, when Kevin and I touched down on the island, about 170 years later, we found that the island was still a very alien landscape. I mean, it's hot, red earth, flinker, a really challenging place to live. And it's only when we made our way to the terraformed epicenter of the island and went up the mountain that we found this kind of relief. Um, it was green, it was wet, it was considerably cooler than the rest of the coast. I mean, it had changed the climate of the island. And for two people, like Kevin and I, from Ireland in the UK, it felt like home. Um, and we realised this was the point. These Victorian scientists wanted to make the island into something like home. They were reproducing what they thought of on the island as an ideal. But the longer you spend up on Green Mountain, this artificial forest, things start to feel uncanny. So first of all, it's the sound. Although it looks at times like a tropical rainforest, there are no insects, very few birds. Uh, the only real sound is the wind through the trees. And as you ascend the mountain, um, you start to notice other strange things. Uh, imagine the mountain is having rings like um i just think of uh, the diagrams of dante's inferno so the bottom ring 
of the island is dense kind of Norfolk pines, it's slightly like England. Then if you're a little higher, there's a layer of banana trees, then South American trees of big ficuses, and at the very top, there's a, a bamboo forest. And the point of this detail is to describe an environment which, more than anything else, mirrors the society that created it. It's a product of empire. These are plants taken from all around the British Empire. We realised that all of the forest, this was a garden, and it wasn't natural in any sense, but a reflection of the human culture and the ideo ideologies that had made it. It's an ideology of empire, uh, belief in the survival of the fittest, and the kind of and the throwing together of all these different species kind of reflected this brutal kind of sense that the strong, you know, the survivors have a dominion over the weak. And there's this, there was this sort of paternalistic uh, imperial desire to, you know, improve it in, 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 in a way that they thought was best, they thought they knew best. Um, and they have changed the, the island's ecosystem. They've transformed the soils, they even brought rain or at least moisture to the island. Um, they've created their idea. But the new ecosystem was completely devastating for the other endemic species. And uh, even for most of the new species that they introduced, obviously most of the animals or plants that they bring die almost immediately um, rather than taken to the environment. So we realized that this was, um, you know, this, this, this island, which had been built as a solution for greening deserts, combating climate change, and even making Mars habitable, it was a lot more complicated. Um, and it was clear that whatever your intentions in creating new environments, uh, new places to live in, new colonies, societies, they'll inevitably reflect all of the assumptions and ideologies contained in your present culture. Um, and that any attempt to create something like a nature uh, was, you know, something outside of human culture was essentially impossible. So yeah, Ascension Island isn't just a template for the process of transforming environments, it's a story that urges us to consider our role more carefully as uh, humans when adapting nature and in designing new ways to live in harmony with our own environment. Um, so I think I will look at a clip from the film. Uh, Nishita, can you go ahead and start, uh, play the clip? I'll stop sharing. Okay, cool. When planetary missions, when space probes started reaching Mars and seeing how unearthlike it was, that fed parascientific speculation about how you would make Mars more Earth-like, how you would terraform it, how you would thicken its atmosphere, melt its ice caps, warm its surface. And in the 1990s, a British ecologist, David Wilkinson, pointed out that a very good analogy to this was what had happened on Ascension Island, that the greening of Green Mountain was effectively a piece of terraforming. Mars has been many different kinds of place over the course of its four and a half or five billion year lifespan. Mars was once seemingly as wet and as atmospherically rich as Earth, but that lack of a magnetosphere left it vulnerable to the cosmic rays, sort of plucking away the water and the air, you know, bit by bit. We could look at a place like the Moon or Mars in the terms that, uh, say, Buzz Aldrin used when he walked on the surface of the Moon. I think he called it magnificent desolation, that it's an empty place, that there is no nature here in the way that humans usually tend to understand that term. But I think by observing a place like Mars on its own terms and let fall our preconceived notions about what a nature is, we might see a lot more than desolation.
I think the idea of Ascension as a very barren place to which life has been brought plays into ideas of Mars, but Mars is incredibly old. Even the new bits of the surface are billions of years old. Ascension Island is incredibly young. Everything is still rugged. It's almost still warm with the heat of the Earth that bore it. So there's an interesting moral question there about is it right to try and make it into some sort of like green and pleasant land? Or is, is there a respect that's actually due to an emptiness, to uh, a barrenness? Humans have a tendency to equate the natural and the living. It's in the life of nature that people find much of its value. And when people think about deserts, it's often their want of life or their potential for brief spurts of life after a single shower or something like that, which, which motivates people. But nature doesn't have to be alive. Nature doesn't have to be ecosystems. And if you look beyond the Earth, you will find that that which is natural is naturally remarkably, shockingly, inspiringly barren. So like the paradox at the heart of terraforming. If you make something into something utterly other from itself, at some level you're betraying its nature, but at the same time you're bringing what we think of as nature to it. You are making it green, you are making it moist, you are making it lush, you are making it a place that you can imagine yourself. And this comes back to ascension. Nature is as social almost more socially constructed than any of the other big terms with which we try to come to terms with the world. And so if you want to change a climate in a way that in some sense nature might prefer, you are always doing the unnatural in service of nature. Sometimes the way to conserve something is to maintain its lifelessness, its difficulty, its desert. If we're going to be practitioners of the design of world systems, we have to be students of world systems as well.
there's the kind of Rousseauian concept of like an original sin, a fall from you know a state of nature into this state of exception that is separate from nature. Partly because you know we seem to have this ability to, for better or worse, affect you know big scale environments. Just the acknowledgement of an Anthropocene is also an acknowledgement of, you know, pulling apart from an idea of nature over here and an idea of humanity over here. But I think you have to go back in because there is that inextricability that is impossible to get away from. As humans interact with different environments than the environment that has deeply shaped us so far. All those environments, we will attempt to change. We will attempt to terraform in different ways, again, for better or worse. But those environments also will anthroform, right? That interaction is going to go two ways. And we fail in any kind of terraforming or any kind of world building at the scale of the spacesuit or at the scale of another planet to the extent that we forget that we depend on all kinds of other things that are not like us. Because if there's anything we've learned from you know, the world system that we've studied for the longest, is that that's its defining characteristic. Well, I think that was a really uh, thought-provoking clip, and um, there are so many things that I can think about in so many different dimensions by just watching uh, a brief tip from, from the documentary. So to discuss more on Terraforma, Kevin and Lawrence, uh, back to you, and then uh, we'll be introducing Fred as well. So Kevin and Lawrence. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so just a couple of words on uh, following the clip. Thanks for showing it, by the way, and I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, I, I'm sure people recognize the voice of uh, the wonderful Fred Sharman, who's with us uh, tonight. Um, and also uh, there's Oliver Morton, who is in the clip, uh, a science writer who we interviewed with the film. Um, uh, just We found that because subjects such as conservation and uh, geoengineering and terraforming are highly emotive, uh, we had quite... Uh, different reactions from the various people we interviewed for the film and this led to discussions around world building and um, design ultimately and uh, as, as kind of seen in this uh, segment of the film some of the key kind of questions that arose from our discussions were ideas around how much of a role humanity should take in preserving or or interfering with these quote-unquote natural spaces um outside of our own and if if so can we do it sustainably and even how important are these kind of issues on earth or even looking into the future uh in places like space which we would consider lifeless you know are there any kind of ethical implications from uh terraforming or, or geoengineering in that respect um and i guess you know these questions are all you know have no clear answer to them and uh, people will have very different perspectives as they do in the film. And so I'm looking forward to hearing from Alessandra and Fred this evening on what they think. So, uh, yeah, I guess back to you, Mahad. Uh, thank you. Uh, so now we'll uh, go and uh, listen more from our wonderful uh, speakers, uh, Alessandra and Fred. So, um, uh, Fred, do you want to present a, a, a topic of your choice related to Ascension now, or should we uh, uh, go to Alessandra's presentation first? Well, I'm happy to yield since you all just heard some of my voice uh, there on the film clip. So, um, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, should I should I display your presentation now? Oh I no, I'm I'm happy to to uh, go after Alessandra okay. since you just heard from me a little bit already. So that's that's great. <clears throat> okay, Alessandra, so now is the time for your presentation and your remarks on 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 the documentary and on terraforming. Great. Thank you so much. Um before we start, can you confirm that you can see my screen? I can. Perfect. Let me try to put um this interview. 
All right. Well, um, again, thank you for inviting me to this wonderful panel. I learned so much from the webinar. It was really, uh, from, from the documentary, it was really thought provoking. And before we talk about whether we can adopt a conservationist approach to terraforming in space, um, I want to go through a couple of slides just to give us an idea of what terraforming a celestial body might entail. I don't want to be too technical or scientific, but I do think it could help us um, understand to what extent might we want to talk about conservation or, or preservation, for example. So first of all, why do we even talk about terraforming in the first place? We talk about terraforming because to survive, humans need a few things. First of all, we need oxygen to, to breathe. We need water, food. We need a certain temperature, comfortable temperature. We need protection from radiation, shelter. We need a certain amount of gravity, power, and other things like communications with management, medical care, and so on and so forth. And in space on celestial bodies uh, that we know, at least none of these things are, are present, or at least not sufficiently. So if we look, for example, at Mars, even though Mars is considered the best candidate for terraforming, Mars presents a very thin atmosphere composed mostly of CO2, uh, which makes breathing impossible. It has a low atmospheric pressure, so it doesn't allow to uh, maintain water in its liquid form. It has limited resources in terms of fertile soil. Um, it does have resources, but not um, in the concentration or in the form that we need them. So we need to um, extract them and, and process them. It has very cold temperatures, about minus 80 degrees Celsius, um, and extreme uh, variations in temperature. So as Elon Musk uh, put it, uh, it needs a little warming up. Um, and then Mars has no magnetosphere, so no protection from solar and uh, space radiations, which can can be very har harmful to, to humans. You know, you can cause can cause cancer and other issues. Then again, Mars has a weak gravitational pull. Uh, gravity on Mars surface is about 38% of gravity on Earth. And this means not just that astronauts or space settlers will look funny walking on Mars, it actually means that um, they could have severe health consequences like uh, loss of bone mass and um, muscle atrophy and so on and so forth. And then, of course, we can't uh, forget the impacts of isolation with Mars being about six to nine months away from Earth with current spacecraft technologies. So terraforming Mars would require huge um, geoengineering endeavors. First of all, it would require atmospheric manipulation, for example, introducing oxygen, um, it would require temperature regulation, for example, by controlling uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, greenhouse gas levels um, in the atmosphere. It would require introducing uh, water management and water cycle, for example, precipitations, um, and introducing a biosphere, so living organisms to um, begin some of those ecosystem processes that uh, we need to survive. Here in the image, you can see just one example of proposals for terraforming Mars. This comes from NASA researchers who have um, proposed um, using a large magnetic dipole in the uh, Mars L1 Lagrange point. For those who might not be too familiar with this term, this is a point where the gravitational forces between Mars and the Sun uh, sort of balance out. And this uh, magnetic dipole shield would basically um, protect the um, protect Mars so that it can create a magnetosphere, which would then increase temperatures and ultimately potentially allow for humans to inhabit the planet. So as you can see just from this example, there are huge technological constraints and resources limitations to terraforming. Time also being a constraint because to have this type of uh, changes in the environment, um, it will require centuries. So some shorter term alternatives 
are the creation of human space habitats. This is something that actually we, we might be able to see in our lifetime. And here in the slide, you can see just a few examples that have been proposed, uh, such as the Stanford Taurus of the seven, of 1975, which is the idea of creating a, a human space habitat in the um, form of a donut, basically, uh, which would rotate so as to create artificial gravity through centrifugal forces. Um, this a similar idea was picked up by O'Neill and again by Jeff Bezos, which mentioned this as a potential solution for um, planetary interplanetary settlements. And then, of course, we have Elon Musk, who is aiming to create a self-sustaining city on Mars by 2050. And so as we um, plan to become a multi-planetary species, we start encountering some ethical considerations that were mentioned by the previous speakers, as well as the documentary. First of all, uh, I want to mention the Outer Space Treaty because as of today, this is the main uh, governance framework that we, that we have for outer space um, activities. Um, in the Outer Space Treaty, Article 1, it says that the exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interests of all countries and shall be the province of all mankind. And so here you can start to see where the disagreements might come in because what is a benefit? Is a benefit an economic benefit? Is it a scientific benefit? Or what about those cultures that might see some celestial bodies uh, that might give them significant religious significance or cultural significance? And so again, what, uh, how do you determine the value of a celestial body? And here I want to draw again from the documentary where you compare, do we, does the celestial bodies have intrinsic value? So is the value in their integrity or is the value in their resources? And so to what extent can we talk about conservation or should we talk about preservation? I think if you, as we've seen from the previous slides, there is basically no way to terraform a, a planet while maintaining some of its integrity. We might be able to do so uh, through space habitats. If they are confined to a certain area, we might be able to preserve some of that original integrity of, of Mars or, or of another celestial body. And so, I want to draw once more um, and leave you with this thought. Um, like you said in the documentary, any kind of geoengineering that we're going to do is always going to reflect our own priorities and our own values and our own sense of what we want. And so I will end my presentation by asking the questions, what are the values that we want to bring to space? And let's think about, for example, the words that we often use when we talk about uh, space exploration, we often talk about colonization, we talk about settlement and exploitation. And we know that words are not just words, we know that words have a legacy, have a history. And so is this the legacy that we want to bring to space? And with this, I'll stop sharing slides and maybe pass it back to the panel. Uh, thank you. Sandra for the wonderful presentation, um, very informational technical knowledge and very relevant uh, humanistic aspects of the words that you mentioned. So if we are going to repeat our patterns, then there is no fun. If only we can, as a human species, try to do diff things differently in this new exploratory medium, uh, then that would, that would mean that we are learning and growing. But, but so far with, with, with the large constellations and with the amount of space debris, doesn't seem like we have learned too much so our efforts and uh, our intentions are uh, going to be there for long term and uh, and with this i'll uh, share the screen for um fred's uh, presentation and uh, fred uh, the floor is all yours now thanks mahad and thanks alessandra 
Um, Alessandra, it's always great to connect with someone who's affiliated with the Colorado School of Mines, because I know that you all are having these conversations um, in real time there all the time. And it's it's really interesting to see the sorts of things that come out of that program there. Um, I know that it's one of the only programs in the world, right, that thinks about space mining um, in both practical and critical conceptual terms. Um, so I hope to intersect a, a, at a few moments with the things that you had to say. And um, I'm really grateful for your presentation for uh, introducing so many things to the conversation. So for me, I I, I kind of keep this list of um, of notes to self about um, sort of concepts I don't know quite where to put in ongoing work, but that get stuck in my head almost like a song. And so these are kind of prompts or provocations that I keep to 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 think with when I'm thinking in these territories and about these kinds of things. So before I go into them in, in some small detail, um, I want to back up again to the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 that Alessandra mentioned. Um, it's such a utopian document. We don't usually find things that sort of make your hair stand up in international law, but that document is, um, I think, one place that has that effect. Um, and one of the one of my favorite portions of the treaty is Article Five, which says, in part, "quote In carrying on activities in outer space and on celestial bodies." the astronauts of one state party shall render all possible assistance to the astronauts of other states' parties. And so there are a few things going on there. Um, first of all, we have a pretty clear and concise definition of an astronaut. Um, we can interpret an astronaut as being anyone who's carrying on activities in outer space. So it's a very broad and inclusive net there that's drawn. And then we have the assignation of that figure to certain rights and responsibilities. Uh, in particular, uh, the responsibility and the right, the responsibility to offer and the right to ask for mutual aid, or as the treaty puts it, all possible assistance. And as I'm, uh, as I'm watching, you know, even just now, uh, that clip again, that uh, Lawrence and Kevin shared from the film, I'm thinking, and I just added as another note to myself, might that responsibility to offer all possible assistance extend even to non-human actors in these systems and spaces? Um, because the the designation of astronaut is not necessarily limited to humans who are in these hostile and dangerous environments. So um, so that is a background basis. Just first of all, really quick, I'll, I'll run through uh, each of these and where I'm at uh, in thinking about what they what they sort of mean to me. There is no outside anymore is a phrase that captures for me a basic aspect that defines habitable worlds and everything we know about them. Um, that the, this quality of closure that they have. And closure is essential, of course, in the hostile environments we find away from Earth. So drawing a line, which is the edge of a habitat or the edge of a, of a volume of space, a space suit, is a necessary sort of first act. But closure and control increasingly colors our understanding of Earth itself um, also. Even 50 years ago, for example, it was acceptable to conceive of throwing things away um, now we know better that there really is no way. There are just other places. So uh, accidental closure, the sort of situation we find ourselves in um, after the, the mapping of spaces like Ascension Island, the closure of the map, the closure of the, the system that leaves us without an outside to throw things to uh, is our sort of basic, uh, it's, the, it's the basic defining characteristic of our relationship with the world that we already exist within. So that control and enclosure will have to get intentional in one way or another, that capabilities developed to regulate closed habitats away from Earth will have to, in some way, be redeployed back on it. And one of the examples that um, I always think about is the notion of um, a kind of uh, global thermostat, right? If we could, if we could gain the capability to, um, to on purpose affect the climate uh, and stop accidentally affecting the climate, it's an imperfect metaphor, but uh, something like a global thermostat might exist. So immediately we have to ask whose hand is on that global thermostat and who gets to decide what the parameters would be? Um, who gets to decide what number should show up? on that kind of control device. And that's a kind of crisis of specificity that uh, for me in general, the notion of a crisis of specificity describes a moment when uh, in a closed system, all parameters have to be 
explicitly specified and numerated so that whenever an explicit choice must be made between fraught alternatives, like the number on something like a global thermostat, a crisis of specificity arises. Um, this is the fact that every choice comes with unwanted consequences, but nevertheless, a choice must be made. So with every capability that we, a, a, a humanity we, a global we gains, the questions arise, the question arises, what is to be done? How should this new technique be applied? And so one of the answers to that, I think, uh, is maybe to plan for abundance instead of planning for optimization. So these inventories and numerations that show up in the previous two principles are in a way traps. Another consequence of an expanding capacity for control is a mindset that seeks always to optimize. But a world where there are just enough things that arrive just in time is a brittle one. We don't want just enough. We want more than we think we need. And again, in my field, architecture and engineering, we see plenty of positive examples of that principle applied. We decide, okay, what, what sort of load should this floor carry? What's, what should we engineer this floor um, to support? And then we take that and we um, multiply it by a factor of 1.5. We build in extra into the system. We ask ourselves how many people are going to be occupying the space and we wanna provide emergency exit capacity for those people in the event of something like a fire. And then we double that emergency exit capacity so that in case one way is blocked, we always have another. So this principle that always seeks to add more and more and more instead of just enough has a long precedent in the production of the built environment. And I'd say, you know, hopefully a long future in the production of future worlds. And so then finally, the uh, and this is less, less clear to me, um, but the notion of designing the storm is something that I find really fascinating if we're talking about the production of worlds at any scale again architecture and environmental design and environmental control is usually involved with creating shelters from the storms. But storms are, are functional. Storms dissipate heat while turning it into kinetic energy. They serve useful functions as well as um, aesthetic and cultural and spiritual functions. So as we make the kind of um, the coziness of the shelter, we might find that we also depend on designing something like the storm to shelter ourselves from. Again, I don't know quite what that means in practical terms, but uh, maybe I'll leave it there. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Fred. Um, I really like the idea of uh, creating a storm um, in, in literal terms, because uh, here on Earth, uh, when we talk about storms, we have like atmospheric storms or the storms on uh, on earth and then we have uh, the solar storms yeah. and the reason we are unable to uh, one of the one of the reasons we are unable to uh, live on other planets is because uh, they don't have uh, enough uh, atmosphere that can uh, safeguard us from the solar particles and the solar storms and the the highly ionized magnetic field mm -hmm. So to think of creating uh, ozone or thinking about ozone as a storm, an atmospheric storm on a planet that is not Earth is an idea that definitely holds a lot of value and can be explored further of uh, maybe a perpetual storm that creates an atmosphere on a planet where we might be able to create a semblance of life. So... That's, that was really, really interesting. And uh, and thank you so much for for your presentation. Um, at this point, um, <clears throat> we basically have uh, gone uh, through the presentations of all of our uh, panelists for this webinar. And now uh, the floor is open for questions and, and further discussion. So uh, if you have a question, you can uh, type it in the chat and I'll get to it. But to formally start the discussion, Fred, I'll come back to you again. Um, you wrote in your 2021 book, uh, Space Forces, that the phrase space colony is often used uncritically without any thought for the larger implications of the second term, which, which is colony. So if the fraught history of colonization on Earth is considered at all, it is usually dismissed. And uh, Ascension Island is, of course, a colonial project. So 
how does the term colonization and colonialism relate in regard to Ascension Island and, and to the settlement of permanent colonies uh, outside uh, in space and on other planets? So back to you. Yeah, there are so many there are so many intersections there. I think it's it's really interesting to think about. Um, Alessandra brought to the table the um, the Stanford Taurus and the O'Neill cylinder from originally going back to the 1970s, and that that was the the start of my interest in this kind of work was uh, was researching and finding more about the kind of conversations that existed when those proposals were were publicized, and they really got a lot of publicity at the time. Um, and they still pop up in different ways, not least, of course, in Jeff Bezos' uh, kind of planetary and spatial imagination. One of the things that people were talking about in the 1970s was this term colonies. So that right from the start, you know, they they sort of zeroed in on the complicated, fraught nature of the language and the conceptualization. And Stuart Brand, who was a kind of countercultural icon in the United States, was writing about these ideas and he sort of brings up the the notion of the, the problematic aspect of the word colonies only to dismiss it when he says that well you know by colonization we mean displacement and stealing other people's land and since we're going to space and building this new land especially in the case of the Stanford Taurus right new ground in space when we're building this new land there's no one there that we're displacing so it's it's the good kind of colonization is what he says and which is which is really an interesting phrase to look back on from the point of view of the 2020s. I think that Stuart Brand's notion of colonization is very narrow. He reveals a very kind of small uh, way of thinking about how the term is deployed. It's not just displacing people and taking their land. It's not just you know guys with guns that show up in boats and say we're in charge now. It's a whole literal worldview. Um, for for me, you know, building on the work of anthropologist Lisa Masseri, she talks about a planetary imagination, the way we think of what what is a planet in the first place and what is a planet for, what is a planet like. Colonization is a very particular kind of planetary imagination that says the uh, the only way in which to think about difference is to think about difference in terms of hierarchies. How much use is this land being put to, and can I put it into better use? better defined as more productive for, you know, me personally, whoever I happen to be. So um, it's a it's a way of thinking that thinks in terms of, okay, there's a center and the center will benefit from what happens at the edges. The center, you know, in the case of the film, being you know, the center of the British empire, benefiting from the edges of empire in all kinds of different ways. So benefiting from places like Ascension Island. And that Ascension Island is, is in some sense, you know, reduced its, its range of possibilities. It's it's possible modes of existence are reduced and made to conform to the imagination that drives the overall project. So I think it's it's really is this, this worldview that's built on hierarchy that defines colonization, um, which opens up a lot more, as Alessandra says, exploitive practices to our field of view than if we think of colonization as mere displacement. It's much more complicated than that. Uh, thank you, Fred. And uh, just just to comment on it, um, the the current bifurcation of developed space countries and emerging space economies mm -hmm. is also a reflection of who was a colonizer and who was a colonized. Yeah. And uh, when we take these things into the space domain, um, we that from Pakistan as a Pakistani as a country that was colonized for 200 years more than 200 years by the by the British Empire um we still see uh the consequences of of, of what happened and how we have to like truly be liberated from it but um just building upon it I wonder if there is a positive word a term with a positive connotation that involves exploration, and uh, settling somewhere. So I was thinking like a lot of terms are maybe like gentrification or any other terms where people are moving and, you know, changing things and, you know, taking benefit, like all of them, all of those terms have some negative connotation or as Alessandra said, those words have histories and, and stuff. So uh, I think that I'll be thinking is, is uh, how we can frame 
uh, our ideas about space exploration and terraforming other planets in with, with terms that okay. have more positive legacy. But but building upon Alessandra, um, what do you think are the risks and potential opportunities in in creating new systems for governance, extraction, and con con conservation in outer space? And uh, how is space sustainability something that we have to be aware of, even at the earliest stages of space exploration and settlement? Thank you, Mahad, and also thank you for your question. I don't think I have an answer to what positive terms you could use, but that's definitely something I'll. I'll be thinking about and I'll be happy to circle back and 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 discuss. Um, but when we talk about governance, definitely we need a new governance framework for space activities. And this is because the Outer Space Treaty, like Fred also mentioned, is today completely outdated. When it was um, established, there was basically no commercial sector back then. So the stakeholders have changed, their interests have changed, and of course, the technologies have changed. Um, that doesn't mean we have to completely build from scratch. There are examples here on Earth that we can use to um, create governance around so-called common goods, like um, the high seas and our Antarctica are examples that are often brought about when we look at how could we manage space resources and make sure that humanity ca can benefit from them. Of course, those examples have their own um, positives and maybe a bit of negatives, lessons learned, um, for example, lack of enforceability and, and others, but definitely we can, we can learn from, from those examples. And so as we build new governance systems for space uh, resources, um, thinking about sustainability, I think, can help us um, be future-proof, can help us think about what could be the impact impacts of the activities today is for the generations of tomorrow. If we look at the situation with space debris, um, we haven't we have been focusing on how can we send more rockets to space, more satellites to space. We haven't really thought through what will happen next. And so in simple terms, thinking about sustainability from the very beginning, I think is a way for us to anticipate those reflections around what happens next. And so, yeah, I think this is where conversations like the one we're having today are extremely meaningful and, and valuable. Uh, thank you, Alessandra. And uh, yes, I, I, from personal point of view, I do sometimes think that in my lifetime, what technical ideas would, would be, would manifest that I would be able to see whether we, would we be living on Mars or maybe uh, living in the orbit and, and stuff like that? So uh, that's definitely uh, something to think about and even write about. But back to back to our discussion, and my next question is for, for Kevin and Lawrence. Um, Terraforma presents the history and legacy of Ascension Island. Um, how would you describe the attitude of the 19th century architects of Ascension? And uh, do you find these sentiments reflected elsewhere either in their own time or or in uh, today's time? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, in their own time, of course, I think they uh, we sort of made the point, I think that the, the island is ultimately just a reflection of all of the kind of combination of ideologies and sort of governance that sort of went into creating it. I'm not sure whether we could say we have directly the exact same ideology and that I think the people who uh, transformed ascension had very few moral qualms about what they were doing they wouldn't even have considered it as a as a potentially ethical slippery slope um i mean it, it was still the time of slavery for example um so i think that was the last thing on their minds but i think we, what we do still have maybe the ideology has slightly changed but the governance as alessandra mentioned um is it's still pretty much the same i mean it's large now ex former colonial states um and enormous global corporations who are the going to be the main drivers of any kind of future geoengineering project on earth or even just afforestation projects um we still see i think a similar kind of uh, paternalism both in in geoengineering projects afforestation projects uh, that are planned um often in the name of combating climate change and actually also in conservation um I mean, across the world, really, I don't, I don't know, whether it's sort of turning deserts green um, 
usually the people who are planning to turn the these desert green be it in the Middle East or wherever are, 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 are not the people who live in those deserts um, or the people who are used to living in deserts. Um, it's usually people from a very different kind of context. Um, and that is perhaps the same kind of paternalism that we, we saw in the Ascension Island project. Obviously, it's a little bit different because Ascension uh, never had anyone um, living there. Um, but yeah, I imagine it'll be the same going forward. Uh, Kevin, do you have any any more to build upon that? Uh, no, I, th I think Larry sums up pretty well. <laughs> All right. Just an open question for all our panelists. Um, conservation of an artificial ecosystem is brought up in, in, in the documentary. So what lessons do you think we can learn about the creation of transplantation of ecosystems for the purpose of space colonies from Ascension Island? Any any of the panelists are welcome to take the lead on on this one. One of the things I don't have a I don't have an easy answer for that. Um, partly because you know I think it's complicated by even again you know rewatching bits of the film um, just now and seeing this you know this, this portrait of a landscape which is mostly becoming still uh, is really evident and in, in each of the shots the the notion that this world is changing this little world lit that's on the island is still that it's still in the process of some kind of change i think really comes through in that bit and so i in, in a way that undermines the idea of preservation because how would you preserve you know you would lose that you lose the evocativeness of the of the landscape and uh the, the qualities that it has because we see it in motion we see the grasses you know either retreating or advancing on those slopes um, to hear about these concentric layers of, of banana trees and bamboo forests um, is really fascinating. I, I'm thinking about the, the boundaries between those zones and how those must be, you know, still in a constant state of becoming, um, you know, which wins the, the banana or the bamboo in a given year, given rainfall or temperature, things like that. Um, so, you know, in a way like, uh, you know, viewing the film, viewing the, this bit of the film again, has made me think more about the the things that we can get in, in letting go of conservation and just watching the becoming or enabling the becoming. Even though, as as you say, Kevin and Lawrence, that there's that battlefield, that becoming is a battlefield, and it's littered with the uh, the corpses of of the plants that didn't make it and the animals and organisms that didn't survive um, that becoming. So it's a it's a tragedy too, but it's just it's it's so I mean through through you all's lens it's so fascinating. Um, thank you, Fred, and just just to build upon that, um, how do these questions relate to the concept of architecture and design in relation to space colonies? Um, do these complexities change the relationship between the human being and the design environment? Um, uh, so because of your background in architecture, um, how would you relate? Uh, the expansion in terms of design and architecture in, in the space medium. So some things should be utilitarian, right? Some things should be, if not worlds that are for us, at least affordances that are for us. If if biological humans are going to survive in space, so the dangers that uh, Alessandra underlines are, are very, very present. And architecture and design, I think, tell us that that there are there are ways to mitigate those dangers. We think of architecture and design as being about you know making things nice and organized and pretty and having an aesthetic expression that relates to a cultural kind of attitude. But it's ninety nine point nine percent of it is making sure things are specified correctly so that they will be safe and uh, available to use for anyone who inhabits the environment. I mean, for example, I did this research just recently to check it out to double check. The, the height of a door, something really simple, like the height of a door handle um, is so over-specified that pretty much globally, if you reach for a door expecting to find a handle where it exists, you will find it within a few centimeters, no matter whether you are in Pakistan or whether you're in London or whether you're in Baltimore. Um, the, these, uh, these affordances, in some ways, the specification, that crisis of specificity, it helps us be something like global citizens. It helps us to... Um, to be able to survive and thrive in the environments that we create. So um, 
So I think that that for me, again, connecting you know these fields, people working in space science and people working in the built environment fields, the more traditional built environment fields, they remind us that everything is designed, you know, in, in our environments and whatever environment we're sitting in now by people according to, you know, complex webs of interdependence. And that uh, that living in space sort of just draws super extra thick lines under all of that. Um, we will encounter almost nothing but design um, if we live in space. And getting past the, the constructed environment, which as we've talked about here, is a reflection of ourselves and our abilities, also our desires and our kind of um, aspirations. Getting past that to see the other is going to be the challenge, even if that view of Mars is out the window, right? Everything else in the field and even the properties of the window itself will be over-specified. So I, I think that's what's fascinating is that design in some sense is meant to mitigate encounters with the other, but it's those encounters with the other that we that we also want. You know, that's that's essentially why we go out into space is to find these other environments and to learn more about them. Um, whereas the territory of things that we make is about making that other as safe and usable as possible um, for us as we are. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I think I think living on Earth is like uh, is like kindergarten as compared to uh, us thinking about living on any other planet. And before we begin to live on any other planet, we would have to uh, sustain a presence in, in the orbit. And in order to sustain a presence in the orbit as, as an outpost, we'd have to uh, focus uh, on our design with so many more moving parts than we have on Earth. And those moving parts would be um, used uh, to live, to create uh, artificial gravity, to maintain our health in orbit. And then we have a huge range of topics like in-orbit manufacturing, in-orbit assembly, in-orbit servicing. And creating all those facilities so that uh, uh, so that Earth is not the only place where uh, the missions have to come back. So uh, I believe that the design with all these moving parts is just going to be incredibly difficult, but also that provides us uh, uh, another motivation to expand the horizons of human thinking, design, and innovation, where we literally can make things happen. Uh, as far as we can conceive them from a technical point of view. So uh, that was great. Um, lastly, um, uh, just to uh, finish the webinar, um, my last question is that, uh, are there any elements of discussion uh, that are applicable on our planet Earth from everything that we have discussed in this webinar, from moon to Mars, from uh, terraforming uh, planets, uh, there have been a wide range of topics and uh, but but coming back coming back home, coming back to our mother earth, are there things that we can do better uh, by drawing lessons from the documentary from the experiment of uh, geoengineering on Ascension Island? So back at the home turf, anyone? Um. Well, I think the main thing that, that we sort of got out of uh, got out of it was that in order to create any of these large scale uh, projects of transformation, landscape transformation, or even larger scale, um, we really have to develop a way to hear voices which are sometimes almost impossible to hear. Obviously, if you're dealing with various sort of human groups, I mean, we're we're not even good enough at hearing all of the kind of human voices that that, that need to be. Um, heard when sort of undertaking any of these projects so obviously the idea that we're going to be able to uh i don't know be able to properly convene with the non-human elements is is always going to be difficult but i think we have to uh come up with some new means of um i don't know creating these kind of parliaments um i think that's the main sort of difficulty uh I, I, there's obviously a question far beyond me but um <laughs> more webinars will uh, sort it out um yeah um, cool. Um, I, I think that uh, there are definitely a lot of lessons that we can draw from um, uh, Ascension Island. For example, we can just look at, 
that uh, there was no green cover on Ascension Iron before. And uh, now there is a good percentage of uh, green cover. And we can compare that to the amount of green cover that we had on Earth 200 years ago. And uh, the green cover we have uh, right now because of intense amount of deforestation for capitalism. So definitely we can just draw comparisons that at one end, we made an unhabitable place. Uh, uh, we gave it a living environment. But on the other hand, the place that we were able to live comfortably we are we are destroying it so definitely there's a uh, uh, there's a discussion there can be discussion on that aspect there can also be discussion about the population of ascension island and why still there are very few people who choose to live there and uh, the population of earth and how the resources of the earth are are limited and how we can we have to uh, plan um, in in more robust terms, as into how uh, the resource utilization can be balanced out uh, to create an equilibrium with with nature. So I believe that there are definitely lessons from this point of view. Um, anyone else? All right. Um, this marks the end of our webinar. Um, I'm very glad for the discussion that happened. I'm very glad for all the wonderful speakers. Kevin, Lawrence, Fred, Alessandra, thank you for your valuable time. This has been an amazing discussion. And uh, I know that a lot of people are not uh, online on this webinar, but I can assure you that a lot of people would be listening to this discussion because this is recorded and it will be uploaded to our YouTube playlist and uh, people would be coming back uh, to this topic as it is uh, highly relevant and uh, would be would be applicable as an educational material for for such discussions um feel free to stay in touch with uh, the space safety and sustainability project group and uh, we always welcome any research projects any other activities that can be carried out and uh, we would always be supporting any initiatives that are relevant to safety and sustainability of mankind here on earth and on other planets um thank you so much for your time and uh uh, with this, uh, we formally end the webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks guys. So yeah. great to talk with everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll stop sharing and uh, that's it. We don't have any questions. Um, cool. Uh, Nishita, thank you so much for your help. Um, Really appreciate, uh, really appreciate uh, you being here and uh, let's call it a day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Take care.